Hello, everyone, and welcome to this UNCDF webinar on this important topic, enhancing remittance data through the assessment on informal remittances. I'm Louis Formantin. I'll be your host for today. Um, we have a very interesting session today with massive panelists. Um, but before we get the session started, I'm just going to give you a brief logistic note. So this webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will last for about one hour and a half. And we'll share the recording with every participant. Also, there's a Q&A uh, section at the end of the, um, of the webinar. So please use um, the Q&A to ask your question to the panelists and men by mentioning their names. Now that everything is settled, I'll just uh, give the floor to my esteemed colleague, Henri Domel. So Henri is the director of inclusive finance um, at UNCDF, and he will give the opening remarks of this uh, webinar. Thanks again, you all for joining. Henri, please. Thank you, Luis. Dear all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know we are in multiple time zones. Ahead of this session today, I was reviewing, I was reviewing the latest figures on remittances for 2022 as published by the World Bank Remittance Brief this week. In 2022, remittance flows to low and middle income countries increased by 8% to reach the figures of $647 billion after an increase of 10% in 2021. So receive at the household level and especially as a counter cyclical flows during time of crisis, remittance continue to play a critical role both as crucial forex flows, but also at house, household income. Although this may seem a significant volume, it doesn't reflect the actual volume if accounted for informal remittances, and thus the true size of the markets. Understanding remittances market requires more than measuring access to finance and remittance volume. It also requires an assessment of the quality and use of remittance services, as well as a key positive uh, impacts that remittances provide on sustainable development outcome, such as inclusive economic growth, financial resilience, and gender equity. And to address the issue we're going to discuss today, we need three things. First, a collective engagement towards harmonized methodologies to estimate informal remittances that can be deliberated with and recognized by rating agencies. In fact, despite the global significance of remittances, Difficulties in data collection continue to obscure our knowledge of the true volume of remittances, the channel of transfers, and much about who the remittance senders and receivers are. And that brings me to the second point. Better remittance transaction reporting system that enable a shift from traditional aggregated data to transaction level data reporting. And that's a crucial point. Central banks estimate typically focus on remittance transfer through official channel, such as bank. But in practice, the market is fragmented among the diversity of provider type, both licensed and unlicensed, and informal remittances are not captured. And finally, we need to ask ourselves the question, remittances for whom? Who are we targeting? A better understanding of the challenges that migrants, especially women, experience in accessing uh, the product and services that enable affordable remittances through formal channel is very important. Without access to safe, affordable, and convenient remittance services, it is unsurprising that many migrants, particularly women, continue to bypass formal channel and instead use an unregulated network that has ubiquitous in many countries. Often the reliance on informal channel jeopardizes the well-being of migrants and their families and limits their resilience when faced with shocks, including natural disaster, income disruption, death or illness, violence and harassment, or crop failure. Until the widespread deficit of information on the remittance market remains across countries and jurisdiction, it will limit the implementation of policies and regulations that, on one side, can reduce the cost of money transfer, and on the other side, also limit the likelihood of current, deficit, uh, current account deficit. Therefore, shared knowledge opportunities that help central bank and NSOs 
to compile and analyze complete, accurate, and granular rate and statistics would help countries better understand their economy, including their economic vulnerabilities and risk, and formulate more informed policies and regulation that drive private sector investment and strengthen financial inclusion. Through the discussion ahead of us today, and with the ongoing deliberation with each of you, I'm hopeful that these collective efforts and shared learning by the global community will bring more opportunities to strengthen transparency in the remittance markets. And that will further pave the way for migrant-centric policies and regulation and generate appropriate commercial incentive for the private sector to bring otherwise excluded customer segment into the formal financial system. At UNCDF, as an agency mandated with investing and catalyzing capital to support the least developed countries achieve sustainable economic growth, we remain committed to work with public and private sector partners on that important agenda. And I once again thanks you know, each one of you for your active participation and interest. So I will finish. I just wanted to thank you, Deepali and Nibesh, for your moderation, and also give a very warm welcome to the distinguished panelists. You know, and I would like to thank them as, again for the time and engagement and dedication on that important agenda. So with that and this opening remark, Louis, I will give you back the floor and all the best for, for this exciting seminar ahead of us. Louis, back to you. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, now we're gonna move to the panel discussion. Um, you can see Dipali and Ibish will be moderating uh, the panel. I don't know which one of you want to start with the presentation. I think it's Dipali. Um, so Dipali, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Louis, and thank you, Henry, for these uh, key messages which highlight the complexities of addressing informal remittances and the importance of, on the one hand, understanding the issues faced by migrants and their families, and on the other hand, the importance of um, uh, private, public, and multilaterals working together, which is what each member of this uh, panel will be discussing today from their own perspective. So with this great introduction, let me introduce you to uh, the audience uh, to our panel today. We have um, Dr. Marina Monkey, who's the chief of uh, IOM Global Migration and Data Analysis Center. Before joining Jim Dac in 2022, Marina headed the Labor Mobility and Social Inclusion Division in the Department of Policy Support and Migration Management uh, with IOM in Geneva. She joined IOM in 2004 as a migration data specialist, and um, her focus has always been evidence-based, future-proof, and coherent uh, governance of migration. Um, and, and she has been responsible and co-authored several flagship publications such as Sharing Data, Where to Start, migrant profiles, making the most of the process. So Marina will bring in the, the migrant and human aspect of informal remittances, which um, is, is one of the, is one side of this uh, discussion. Uh, we also have Mr. Harry Bascoro, uh, who is currently the head of balance of payment and international investment position statistics division at the Department of Statistics Bank Indonesia. He is responsible for coordinating the compilation of both Indonesian balance of payments and IIP statistics, including the estimation of worker remittances. Uh, prior to his appointment as division head in 2023, Mr. Bascoro worked with Bank Indonesia in various capacities over 28 years, gathering considerable experiences in areas of statistics, regional economics, monetary engagement and management, and foreign exchange management. Um, so different uh, positions held uh, as head of regional economics and financial policy review, assistant director for real economic sector, and senior financial analyst for monetary liquidity forecast team. We also have uh, Mr. Haptam Wokne, who is director of external economic analysis and international relations directorate in the National Bank of Ethiopia. Mr. Wokne has nearly 15 years of experience in macroeconomic research and leadership in the National Bank of Ethiopia. In addition to his research and leadership experience, he brings a wide range of technical experience in balance of payment issues and has held various positions in bilateral, regional, and multilateral trade organizations and divisions within the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Ethiopia. So Mr. Boscoro and Mr. Wokne will speak to the importance of informal remittances in their economies and the methodologies that are used to estimate informal remittances. 
And finally, to bring in the private sector perspective, we have Mr. Saranj Verma, who is Vice President Analyt Analytics and Customer Success Management Therapy. Saranj has over a decade of industry experience and has been at the forefront of making therapy a data-driven and customer-obsessed organization as Vice President of Analytics and Customer Success Management. He is responsible for building Therapy's analytic capabilities, which enables smarter decision-making across the board and empowering the organization's group. He's also um, been with Therapy since its inception, and uh, his focus is on bringing on board Therapy's new partners, clients, um, as a first-time right seamless engagement experience. So a very, very warm welcome uh, to our panelists. Before we start, um, I'd like to just hand over the floor to my colleague, Ibish Kastrati, to just provide us with a brief overview of what do we mean by informal remittances and what we're talking about. Uh, Ibish, over to you. Thank you very much, Dipali. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, before passing to the panelists and uh, hear more about their presentation on informal remittances, just wanted to briefly talk about what are informal remittances. As we know, remittances are emerging as a crucial source of external finance for several uh, least developed countries over, and yet the exact size of these uh, flows remains unknown to policymakers and to the private sector because large portion of, of these flows uh, go through informal channels. Um, for a remittance, uh, from a remittance data perspective in general, and especially for least, least developed countries, Remittances via uh, via formal channels uh, uh, are recorded through uh, reports from commercial banks and money transfer operators, uh, usually through the system that is called the International Transact uh, Transactions Reporting System. Uh, and these are covered well in their uh, balance of payment reports, uh, but uh, leaving a large flow of informal uh, flows unrecorded and unaccounted for in these reports. Um, but what are exactly informal remittances? To answer this, um, we start with IMF's uh, International Monetary Fund's short description of remittances, where remittances represent uh, the household income from foreign economies arising mainly from temporary or permanent movement of people to those econo economies. Uh, IMF discusses remittances in more detail uh, in, in their manual BPM6 and Appendix 5 International Transactions Guide. Uh, com compilation user's guide um, for, for remittances, which uh, my colleagues will share the links uh, in the chat. Um, remittance compilation, the remittance compilation guide does not strictly identify which transaction channels qualify as formal or non-formal, but recognizes that such adjustments are subject to country-specific legal, regulatory, and institutional factors, and therefore they may vary from country to country. So, certain kinds of cash and uncash items that flow through formal channels but are, are currently unrecorded such as money mobile money and uh, uh, remittance service providers and informal cross-border movement of cash and goods that specifically uh, it's geared towards informal channels such as hawala and similar systems hence uh, a broad observation would be that informal channels represent the cash and non-cash items that are not recorded in balance of payment uh, report and that the uh, the data through the data that is captured through regulated channels which we mentioned banks money transfer operators and uh, and sometimes remittance service providers uh, uh, research uh, on on informal remittances uh, suggests that remittances especially for least developed countries uh, tends to be underestimated. Um, flows uh, to developing countries may range from 35 to 75 percent uh, of the formal remittances o overall. UNCDF re uh, research has resulted in several publications on this issue, um, for which we have uh, sh will be sharing the links in this in in the chat. Um, but uh, in, in our work, informed by uh, consultations and feedback, UNCDF. Uh, UNCDF's work on informal remittances combined qualitative and quantitative elements. The, the, qualitative, uh, the quantitative aspects involved developing uh, a model to estimate informal remittance flows, um, while the, the qualitative part uh, entails creating a survey strategy uh, and a questionnaire on informal remittances, which central banks can use to gain more accurate understanding of, of such flows. Um, we would happily be we will be happy to provide more more details uh, but we would also give the chance to to the central banks to present their systems uh, on on how they measure uh, informal remittances uh, and if you have questions we'll be 
uh, answer them uh, at the end of, of the presentation uh, of the webinar. Uh, over to you, Dipali. Well, thank you, Abish. And with that, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Marina, uh, Dr. Marina Manke. Marina, please do share with us your views on the importance of informal remittance flows and as well as the kind of person who you think so, who, who would transfer money informally. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dipali. Thank you, colleagues, uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, indeed, uh, it's it's a pleasure to join uh, this discussion today, and I'm looking forward to actually learning a lot from each of you, uh, because indeed, uh, you and CDF colleagues have done a lot of really great work, specifically what was just right now pre uh, presented to us, how the various estimation techniques or, or research approaches could help us improve uh, availability and understanding of informality within uh, remittance flows. Uh, I hope that within the next 10 minutes, I'll try to be very precise with my statement, I'll um, mention a few Three, few things which I was asked uh, by the organizers of this webinar to indeed, as Dipale says, uh, focus on the actual remittance senders or receivers as uh, the center of of our analysis of our discussion. So this is very dear to my heart, as was mentioned by Dipali before. I have worked in the area of labor mobility and human development, covering also remittances, financial inclusion before I joined the Global Migration Data Analysis Center in Berlin almost one year ago. So today I will be talking about the topic of remittances and informality primarily from the point of data. Indeed, today, the 16th of June, we celebrate the International Day of Family Remittances. And there are very many important statements which have been delivered today, both from the lead organizations. Uh, we know about the forum on uh, remittances and, and development organized in Nairobi. I am also supported the formulation of a policy statement from within the UN network on migration. The key focus is digitalization and financial inclusion and reduction of costs. But indeed, uh, today, uh, let us talk about the data and the knowledge about uh, remittances and specifically, as Dipali mentioned, really the, the, the individuals with the people behind. So the first uh, of the three statements or issues that I want to cover is indeed a very small and very, very succinct uh, explanation of why we need to better understand the informality of remittances. Um, and my statement will be that it's not only to help us design macroeconomic policies or monetary policies, but from IAM's perspective, knowledge about informality is also critical because it allows us to really influence policy design, not only from the perspective of financial policy, but also from the perspective of inclusion and uh, support to people on the move. But of course, as an organization which works directly with migrants on the ground, we also want to ensure that the support measures, the operations that we are delivering also are targeting uh, the people who whose maybe um, inclusion and whose um, uh, income earned abroad is not necessarily um, sufficiently uh, supported uh, by pushing people into really uh, following the informal channels, the risky channels, and leading to lots of loss of, of really hard earned income. Uh, so the second point will be uh, indeed uh, a bit of a quick overview of migrants as what is the profile of migrants? And I think for, for those colleagues on the panel and also who are listening, of course, it's important when we design methodologies of measuring or design methodologies of formulating support measures and maybe services. So migrants really are customers of different financial services. So understanding, know your customer approach is very important from the perspective of also understanding their characteristics and, and also trying to preempt or understand 
understand their behavior in terms of spending, in terms of uh, investment, as well as uh, accessing financial services. And the final statement will be a little bit about our work within IAM in terms of, and, and my center, the team here, as well as Global Data Institute, which has been recently set up, in terms of what we plan to do to contribute to this broader agenda of enhancing knowledge about remittances, specifically the angle of informality. So let me start with the first point, the point in terms of why we need to really focus on sizing and defining formal remittances. We already understood why it's important to measure, to design microeconomic policies from us, from our side. Uh, the key agenda why we want to understand formal versus informal form, uh, format of uh, um, transferring financial uh, remittances and financial flows uh, is really to, to ensure that nobody is left behind. This is our big agenda, and that allows us to ensure that whenever we design support measures for financial inclusion or financial literacy, we really are effective and are really targeting the, those who need our support in, in the most acute manner. Um, so in terms of characteristics of um, migrant population who are remitting and trying to dissect in terms of who is better, um, who is most prone towards taking uh, the decision for formal versus informal uh, um, channel of uh, transferring their earnings uh, across borders. Um, I think it's a very challenging question. When Dipali asked me to, to speak about that, I realized that it's very hard to generalize at the global level. And again, I represent here the global center. And unfortunately, we do not really have estimates on uh, one big number which would say, well, for the world, that is the number. So because indeed the uh, tendency of taking a decision to send remittances by a formal or informal channel will depend on the status of uh, people who are going into migration, on their uh, access uh, to, to banking services, we are aware that uh, I think it's UNCDF's estimates in your uh, Jan uh, January uh, paper, you speak about 35 to 75 percentage of uh, migrants who might be opting for informal channels of sending remittances abroad. Well, based on our research, and you know, I am is conducting multiple services uh, in different parts of the world. So we have also very different estimates. In some corridors, that can be as low as 5% of uh, informal channels and, and adhering to, to formal channels. Uh, and in other corridors, the estimates can range even to 90%. So the latest estimate, for instance, for uh, remittance flows around Limisela are going into the 90s, which is really, really immense. So um, in terms of migrants, and again, the, the challenge of talking about and putting migrants in one in one bulk category, it's, it's really a very, very big um, simplification because, of course, depending not only on, on their legal status or documentation, also depending on the industry where uh, migrants uh, are in, engaging in terms of their employment abroad, in terms of the skill level, the, the tendency towards remit will differ uh, and, and, and the format of remittances will differ. Uh, some of the studies show that migrants may remit uh, and the frequency of, remi of remitting also differs de depending on, on the various parameters of, of migrants. So, um, for instance, uh, since we have a colleague from Ethiopia, I thought that uh, I will um, put on the table a few numbers uh, for our observation from the study we have conducted in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, uh, this is our regional data hub, which is set up in Nairobi. Uh, colleagues shared that those results and, and the survey was conducted in October 2022. And uh, interesting observations uh, based on the survey, one in two households uh, with uh, migrants, at least one migrant were uh, receiving remittances. Uh, and and uh, 
that that amounts to 59% of families with migrants, so they were receiving remittances from abroad. But sometimes migrant families also have more than one migrant working abroad. And for uh, migrants uh, from Ethiopia, the share of households who then received uh, remittances was rising to almost more than 80% of, of receiving remittances. For Ethiopia, based on our study, it will be interesting to hear again from the central bank colleague uh, what their estimates are and whether they are try they are coming together. So, based on our study of surveying uh, more than uh, one thousand households, also key informants, so we estimated that fifty four percent of those who were remitting were using informal channels. Um, and 37 of, of uh, migrants uh, were opting for sending remittances via banks, um, and uh, only 16 went for the uh, official money operator networks. When we speak about the importance of understanding, again, from not leaving anyone behind, for us, it's also important to understand the frequency of obtaining remittances. And what we have observed in Ethiopia, for instance, is that at least 47% of all households who were receiving remittances were saying that these were absolutely critical sources of their income. Um, but drilling further, uh, in terms of the frequency, 16% of the households were receiving uh, remittances every one to two months. And let me say a few words about that cohort of remittance re uh, how receiving households, those who receive um, remittances frequently. Usually they receive re remittances in a smaller sizes of transactions and very often informally. But what is also very important for us to observe is that that points to the clientele, which is really financially dependent on remittance uh, transactions. So, and what, what has uh, emerged during the recent global shocks, in particular COVID, in some countries where all financial transactions were blocked uh, for some period of time, it became clear that some of those households, or most of those who were dependent on, on remittances receiving from abroad, they were really at particular risk of falling into, falling into extreme poverty. So in this situation, knowing that clientele who is dependent on informal remittances and for whom that is really the lifesaver is very critical. So that's an action point for our organization. This is an action point for a lot of our colleagues. We do know that informality level of remittances usually is um, higher in situations and contexts related to crisis. That is something what we observed in the situations like around the crisis in Afghanistan, Yemen, Mozambique, and so on and so forth. So to conclude, I would like to say a few words about how we want to move forward with partners such as UNCDF, UNDP, IFAD, and all the UN community and also governments. So moving forward, we do agree that it's critical for us to bring all our efforts together to better understand not only the composition of format of remittances, but also people who are sending those remittances behind. Our organization has said the Global Data Institute, of which our center is an integral part, together with the Displacement Tracking Metrics Initiative. And that is the initiative which has been compiling a lot of remittance-related information across different parts of the world. So moving forward, let me just mention one concrete initiative we are working on in the next months, and we are looking forward for all collaborators, please stay in touch and get, in, get engaged. So we would like to start telling the story of a particular corridor. So not necessarily a country focus or, or bilateral, but really a corridor looking into mobility across a country of origin and destination, and then overlaying the knowledge on human mobility and numbers of migrants with complementary information, including the financial flows. So there we, on, we should not only work towards um, standardizing the survey questions, how we ask migrants about you know, the size of remittances or the format of their transferal, but also 
start overlaying the numbers on, on people as well as with the numbers of remittance flows within a specific corridor with trade flows and broader financial and, and economic connectivities existing within corridors. So I would like to stop here and looking forward to hearing from other panelists and hopefully maybe afterwards also asking some questions or complementing with additional points if I forgot to mention something. Over to you, Dipali. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Um, thank you very much, Marina. Sorry, I'm just having a problem. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Um, I mean, this has been very informative and also the focus on the migrant as the customer um, is a crucial angle to bring in and also not a very easy one to bring in because as you mentioned, there are such wide differences. Um, the knowledge of informal differences as being important for policymaking and financial inclusion in particular as well as uh, migrants as a customer being important from the financial inclusion perspective, but also from the perspective of uh, vulnerability um, and financial de dependence and crisis situations. Um, completely agree with you on the uh, sizing of remittances data. Uh, we have had a issue actually amongst ourselves because we were trying to figure out, you know, what would be an appropriate size to, you know, on a conservative side, we, st we said we'd stick to 35 to 75%. But totally agree with you. The the estimations um, can can vary. So with that, I will hand over um, to our next speaker, Mr. Harry Baskoro. Uh, Harry, it'd be great if you could share with us uh, the importance of informal remittances for Indonesia, including the channels and impacts of uh, remittance flows, and a brief overview of the methodology used by the Central Bank of Ethiopia of uh, Indonesia. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Pauli. Uh, good morning, afternoon. Evening for um, everybody. I would like to thank the UNCDA for the opportunity to give, to give uh, given to Bank Indonesia to share our experience on recording the remittance of Indonesian migrant workers in Indonesia's balance of payments and to share our insights on the informal remittance data in Indonesia. It is also an excellent opportunity for us to learn, uh, like Marina said, to learn from our my fellow uh, panelists and also from the attendees uh, sharing their experiences. Remittances from our hardworking migrant workers have long been a significant component of our nation's economy, contributing not only to the well-being of their families, but also to the overall growth and development of Indonesia. These financial flows have a profound effect on our uh, balance of payments, influencing our external sector and in shaping our economic uh, landscape. As uh, shown in uh, slide two here, throughout this presentation, we will share to you the concept of a uh, 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 before uh, this number number two, previous slide, please. We will share to the concept of a uh, migrant. Uh, thank you. Uh, concept of migrant workers remittance. Our methodology on recording migrant workers remittance in our BOP and our experience on conducting. Uh, Indonesian Migrant Workers Remittance Survey in 2014. In addition, we also share our views on informal remittance channels, uncovering the challenges and opportunities it presents for economic development. Uh, just skip to uh, slide four, please. Uh, <clears throat> as mentioned in the uh, chat, uh, the concept of remittance refers to uh, IMF BPM6 and IMF International Transactions and Remittances. 2009, these two international manuals are guidance in the compilation of remittances on our balance of payments. Uh, migrant workers remittance is recorded in the secondary income on uh, the BOP, which uh, covers personal transfers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, personal transfers that are recorded in the secondary income of uh, our BOP is uh, defined as follows. All current transfer in cash or in kind made or uh, received by resident households to and from non-resident household personal transfers consist of regular transfers between members of the same families that are resident in different economies. Workers' remittances are subsets of personal transfers. The definition of personal transfer is broader than uh, workers' remittances. Well, things that are not included in personal transfers. Transfers of funds made by parents to the children who study abroad are not considered as personal transfers because these transactions are between residents. Transfer of funds sent by migrant workers to Indonesia to buy real estate or invest directly in local business are not considered as workers' remittances, but as foreign direct investment transactions. And also transfer of funds from temporary migrant workers whose working period is less than 12 months is also not included as personal transfers. 
<laughs> and slide six transfers conducted by migrant workers to Indonesia is considered as inflow remittances on our BOP. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> as Ibis mentioned, uh, the method uh, the methodology for recording migrant remittances in uh, in our BOP is based on administrative data and survey. For the administrative data, we use the data from the Indonesian Migrant Worker Protection Agency, BP2MI in Indonesia, for the number of Indonesian migrant workers placement and the number of returning Indonesian migrant workers to calculate the stock of migrant workers. While for the survey, currently we use the remittance per percentage and salary of the workers based on the result of the survey conducted in 2014. The remittance survey we use is to obtain the required data for the calculation of Indonesian, uh, next slide please, Indonesian migrant workers remittance, also to obtain the update data for information on workers remittance pattern in order to improve the estimation on remittance inflows in the BOP statistics. Uh, we also have updated the, the survey in 2019. However, currently we have returned using the results of the 2014 survey as the numbers are more representative of the migrant work condition after the pandemic. We are currently in the process of conducting an updated survey this year and is projected to be completed by September. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I will just glance quickly through uh, slides 9 to 14 to illustrate the result of our 2014 survey. Uh, based on gen gender, the majority of respondents in 2014 were female workers in, in the age group of 25 to 29 years old and 30 to 34 years old. This was attributable to the prevailing strong demand for female workers to be employed for domestic helpers from receiving countries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll just do, uh, do slide 12, please. Next. Based on the result of the survey, the money sent back by migrant workers to their relatives accounted for 52% 50 of the wages for informal workers and 48% for formal sector workers. Most informal workers had higher remittance than those of formal workers. Uh, next, please. Related to the topic of today's webinar, based on this survey, there were 45% of respondents who, who utilize informal channel or non-bank financial institution to send their money home, such as money transfer operators, money changers, and other remitted agents. Most of our migrant workers chose these informal channel of remittance due to long distance to their offices, the complexities of banking procedures, and higher cost of making remittance through banks than through non-bank or informal channels of remittances. Uh, next slide, please. The recording of migrants' remittance in Indonesia's BOP is still an aggregate value for all channels. Calculating migrants' remittances specifically through informal channels is still one of the issues we face. We do have the information on remittance channels for formal and informal use by migrant workers to send remittance from our latest sur survey. But the information is limited only about the volume of each remittance channel that migrant workers use to remit their money. We do not have information on the amount of money sent through each uh, transfer channel. At present, there's also no information available about the use of the informal remittance channel for each gender. As suggested by uh, UNCDF, there may be differences between genders in using informal means for remittances. We will certainly include these factors in our uh, ongoing survey. Next slide, please. <laughs> the methodology that Indonesia uses for calculating migrant remittances is an aggregate for all channels. We, now, we do not have, uh, gener we, now we do not generate remittances for specific informal remittance channels since we do not have the required data to measure it. Indonesian uh, migrant remittances in our BOP are generated from three main elements, which are the stock of migrant workers, salary, and the percentage of remittance. Uh, next slide, please. There are some uh, challenges faced in order to measure and collect informal remittance data. Uh, uh, this is uh, probably uh, also everywhere. Lack of informal uh, channels, informal remittances typically occur outside the formal financial system, making it difficult for us to track and capture data. These transactions often involve cash transfers or alternative me mechanisms 
that are not easily traceable, resulting in limited visibility and documentation. Also, informal channels and networks. Informal remittances may utilize a complex network of doc, uh, intermediaries, including friends, relatives, and, and informal money transfer operators. Identifying and accessing these channels for data collection purposes can be difficult as they operate outside formal regulatory frameworks. And there's also a self reporting bias. And when uh, when we do a survey, and individuals may underreport or overreport their participation in informal remittance transactions, leading to potential misrepresentation of the actual flows. And also, there's a recall bias in a survey, as respondents may have difficulty recalling specific details of their informal repetitive uh, transactions, including amount sent, frequency, or even the channels used. These recall bias can lead to inaccuracies in the reported data. And also, the challenges is the rapidly changing nature of informal remittance channel. By the time the survey data is collected and analyzed, the dynamics and informal remittance flows may have already changed. Next, please. We have identified that the COVID-19 has had significant impact on various aspects of global economy, including evidence flow. Uh, the pandemic has functioned as a catalyst in accelerating the adoption of digital, digital solutions. We understand that these uh, digital solutions have its advantages. It facilitates faster and more convenient transactions reduces reliance on physical cash and enhances fin financial inclusion for individuals who previously had limited access to formal financial services. However, it is important to note that the extent and pace of digitization may vary across different regions and communities. Factors such as infrastructure development, regulatory frameworks, and the level of digital literacy can influence the adoption of digitalization of informal related channels. There may still be a segment of the population that prefers traditional methods or faces barriers to accessing digital services. Next slide, please. Uh, considering all these advantages of digitization on informal remittance, our suggestions to endorse digitization on informal remittance are to promote financial literacy, conduct awareness campaigns and educational programs to enhance financial literacy, particularly among migrant workers and individuals such as their family who rely on informal uh, uh, remittance channels. Also provide uh, incentive such as a reduced fee or a special promotion to encourage individuals to transact to transition from traditional to digital remit, uh, remittance channel. Also, uh, as mentioned uh, uh, at the opening, we also uh, uh, also um, support a uh, cross-border corpora corporation who foster collaboration between countries to facilitate cross-border digital remittance transfer will, all, will definitely uh, help uh, digitalization of uh, these remittances. Also uh, promote reg regulatory clarity and collaboration, foster collaboration between governments, financial regulators, and industry stakeholders to develop clear and supportive regulatory frameworks for digital remittance services. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, as closing, throughout the presentation, we have explored the challenges faced in measuring and collecting data on informal repetition, which highlights the complexity of capturing this dynamic and informal financial act activity accurately. However, despite these challenges, it is essential to continue our efforts to improve data collection methods and improve uh, our understanding of informal rep remittances. By addressing these challenges, we can provide policymakers, researchers, and relevant stakeholders with valuable insights uh, to inform uh, policy decisions, financial inclusion strategies, and development initiative. Moving forward, collaboration between financial institutions, government agencies, researchers, and migrant communities is crucial. Uh, uh, as a final closing, it is uh, customary in Indonesia to uh, close a speech or presentation with a short rhyming uh, uh, poem called Pantun, much like the Japanese haiku. So let me try to attempt an English version, uh, bear with me. Uh, a, a flock of birds fly over the Jakarta Bay. Sunset hugs the city with tenderness. Dear audiences, I close the pres presentation today with wishes for migrants all everywhere in the world with help help with wealth, health, and happiness. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Harry, for that very rich presentation and, of course, for the beautiful uh, poem to conclude as well. Um, and the best wishes. Thank you very much uh, for that. I mean, some of the key um, statistics that you brought out in terms of 45% of remittances being sent informally um, are you know, not, not surprising, but also they always stand out um, as always, and that 75% of your respondents uh, in the remittances surveys uh, were women. Um, also in terms of the challenges, um, similar to what Marina had highlighted, the lack of documentation, uh, the, the complexity of uh, tracking informal remittances, but yet, as you mentioned, the importance of doing so, and the changing nature of informal remittances uh, being important. Um, the digitization of informal remittances, as you, as you highlighted, is important, but also will require broader uh, changes in terms of infrastructure development, regulatory framework, and digital literacy which in turn, as you mentioned, requires the collaboration between various stakeholders, um, public, private, financial sector, and keeping in mind the migrant itself, um, something that Henry had mentioned in the opening. So thank you very much for that very rich presentation. Our next spe uh, speaker is Mr. Haptamu Wartne. Uh, Haptam, please share with us um, as well from the National Bank of Ethiopia's uh, perspective. The kind of methodology uh, used by the Central Bank of Ethiopia and its importance to the national economy. Thank you. The kind of methodology used by the Central Bank. And its importance to the national economy. Thank you. Uh, introduction and just I am Haptamu from the National Bank of Ethiopia and, and I will Haptamu, we have been sorry but we short presentation on, on how we just compile the also try to explain the site its contribution to our external sector and the major is a major challenge we are facing. So, according to the National Bank of Ethiopia definition, remittance the informal remittance is just defined through its channel. If it comes through the banks or remittance service providers or payment instrument issuers or service providers, it is classified as informal otherwise it will be classified as informal remittance. So the channel determines the formality and the informality of the uh, remittance flow to the Ethiopia. Next slide, please. please. Yes, in Ethiopia, there exists the informal remittance because of, mainly because of the existence of the uh, due to our exchange rate policy. Our exchange rate, the central bank's exchange rate policy is just managed floating. That means it's not a market clearing exchange rate system or a floating exchange rate system. Because of that, there are various exchange restrictions imposed on the transfer of Forex to Ethiopia and away from Ethiopia. Because of that, the uh, informal market emerged and currently there exists a persistently increasing premium between the official and the parallel market and that attracted the inflow of the uh, remittance through the informal channels next slide please in addition to the remittance the exchange rate there are also other drivers of the towards the informal channel the to mention a few lack of access to service in the sending especially due to as it's known the, the there are illegal migrants from ethiopia and those migrants who are living in the host countries have no access for the uh, service the financial service because of their illegality so they prefer to send through the informal channel and the in the receiving the side due to low financial inclusion the financial service providers are not that much in dibs so the receivers also prefer to receive their remittance through the informal channels 
There is also a cost issue, a high direct and indirect costs in the formal channel also drive this, the remittance sender and the receivers towards the informal channel. And in addition to these two factors, there are also the political and social factors that drives the diasporas towards the informal channel. Next slide, please. So informal remittance in Ethiopia comes mainly through two channels. The first one is called Hawala, which, which is the beneficiary receives the local currency without inflow of the equivalent amount of FX. That means the Ethiopians immigrant living abroad will just will not send the FX to Ethiopia. Rather, there is a line, a channel in which the receiver can access the equivalent amount of money in the lo in the local market without the actual sending of the forex to ethiopia the second one is it's also physical sending of money to relatives and there are illegal parallel market in ethiopia since when somebody sends the physical money to ethiopia the forex the through the relatives they just use these informal markets to convert to the format the, to the local currency Next slide, please. So uh, remittance is just one source of informal FX market in Ethiopia. The, there are other sources of the, there exists informal channel in Ethiopia. That means for the supply of the informal channels, remittance is one variable. There are also various uh, activities and variables. To mention a few, in addition to remittance, there is smuggling of export, the under invoicing of export, over invoicing of import, and the foreign tourists who come to Ethiopia, they also just divert the foreign currency and they just convert to local currency in the parallel market. So the major source of the informal channels for the supply of forex are these are mainly from the remittance smuggling of export the under invoicing of export over invoicing of import and the foreign tourists next please looking at the demand who demands this info, informal uh, foreign currency mainly the speculators since the the our exchange rate policy is managed floating and due to the existence of the large premium there are speculators who participate in the parallel market. That means who buys and sells Forex in the parallel market. So they demand Forex for their speculative purpose and for their investments. And there are also individual traveling travelers. Those travelers who couldn't access Forex from the formal channel, they, they just went to the, go to the parallel market and they buy and they satisfy their demand through that market. And they also just, the demand come from the capital flight perspective. Anyone who wants to just use capital flight, use the parallel market as one channel. And for import financing, since there is a huge imbalance between supply and demand in the formal channel, there is a huge demand for Forex from the banking systems. So those importers who couldn't get a forex for, for their to finance their importers they just go and buy from the parallel market and they finance their imports through these mechanisms so these are the major demand for the informal channels next slide please when we look at the performance the informal remittance size the number is very huge when we, when we look at the recent performance, the parallel markets reach around the volume estimated by the National Bank of Ethiopia to be around 2.4 billion. So we estimated that the informal channels forex inflow to Ethiopia is around 2.4 according to last fiscal year's statistics. And when we look at the performance over time, it is increasing from period to period. Next slide, please. So when we look at its contribution to imports, we estimate the parallel market, the informal remittance flow to Ethiopia, and we just calculated its import coverage. 
And in 2016-17 fiscal year, it covers 12% of our merchandise or goods import, and the maximum was 16%. And in the during the last fiscal year, it covered 13% of our merchandise import. So there is a huge inflow of remittance through the informal channels. Next slide, please. So let's say something about our methodology in the calculation uh, methodology to estimate informal markets. Since we, we, we do not have a survey, we use the merchandise import as estimate for the informal remittances. The calculation is simple. What we did is that we have the customs import data. And in Ethiopia, an importer can use both the cash and the Franco Valuta import. So we exclude the Franco Valuta import and we only take the cash importers. And we have also the banking system cash import. So we compare the customs import value, cash import value with the banking system cash import value and we get some differences. If, it, if our total import is just financed by the banking system, the value of this, the customs cash import value, will be equal to the banking system cash import value. But because of various reasons, for example, because of valuation, time difference, and financing through the informal channels, there is always a difference between the customs cash and the banking system cash. So we take some portion. We believe that some the, some par portion of this difference is financed from the informal remittance, and we take the percentage of the difference as informal remittance. Not all. We do not take all the difference as uh, informal remittance. As I said, the difference might come from the valuation because the banking system recurrent imports is not. Uh, is not equivalent to the recording of the customs authority. So this might explain one thing. The other thing is that there is also the variation in valuation of imports. The importer, the actual payment he pay for his import is just might be might not be equivalent to the customs valuation. That have some percentage uh, explanation. So we believe that some import difference between the banking and the customs is financed through the informal channel. So we take a portion of that at the informal remittance and the percentage varies from period to period, considering the macro variables. And we, by just looking at the development of the macroeconomic variables, we change the percentage of this difference as informal remittance. Next slide, please. So when we look at the, what, what are the impacts of the informal remittance to the Ethiopian overall economy, we believe that when remittance moves through the informal or the underground channel, it doesn't contribute to international reserve build-up effort. As you know, the one of our objective as a central bank is just to build our international reserve. So if there is a diversion from formal to informal channels, there will not be a robust reserve threshold for the central bank. So despite it satisfies some demand, import demand, it might not have the contribute anything for the international reserve of the country. The second one is capital flight and possible dollarization will happen if there is expansion of informal remittance flow to the country. And the third one is the there will be the money laundering and funding criminal and terrorist activities will be just uh, made through this channel. So informal remittance, if there is expansion of informal remittance to in the Ethiopia, the negative impact even be higher than what is listed from here. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Depali to you.
very much, um, Hatanu. Um, glad it, it, the the messaging came across um, uh, clearly because there was a bit of a connection problem in the beginning. But thank you for this very interesting and this very clear presentation on, um, you know, I mean, for instance, some of the key things that I saw was uh, the reasons for informality in, uh, in in Ethiopia, which is some of which are similar to Indonesia in terms of costs, um, in terms of financial inclusion. But also the key factor that you mentioned was the exchange rate management uh, issue uh, for Ethiopia, which is specific to Ethiopia. So again, this raises the issue of how every, um, you know, sometimes there could be economy specific, national economy specific structural issues that can uh, change uh, the entire informal remittances uh, flows within the country. The second uh, interesting point that, uh, that that came across in your presentation is the use of informal remittances to actually finance part of the trade sector, which was um, quite interesting uh, also for me as a trade person. But um, yes, uh, very interesting and a strong indication from your figures as to the size of informal remittances uh, for Ethiopia. And finally, as you mentioned, um, the, the NBE model, which is variable based and the impacts of not uh, taking into account informal remittances, which then has impacts for capital reserves, capital flight, and money laundering, among other things, and highlights the need to therefore work towards uh, formalizing informal remittances flows from a regulator's perspective. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Saranj Varma from uh, Terape. Uh, Saranj will discuss uh, observations on informal remittances from the private sector perspe perspective particularly as they relate to why informal remittances is important for the private sector and the need for um, the impact of greater formalization. Ranj, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dipali. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time out to attend the webinar and to the UNCDF team for uh, the, uh, providing me this opportunity, uh, uh, especially on the occasion of International Day of Family Remittances. Uh, it's an important day for uh, uh, the entire industry, you know, where we come together and you know discuss uh, issues and uh, aspects which are important for migrants and uh, cross-border payments, cross-border remittances. Uh, the fellow speakers have already shared such profound insights. I'll try to share some perspectives from Terape's experience as an industry participant. Uh, before going to uh, the topic, I would just uh, take a few seconds to explain for the audience what TerraPay does. So we provide cross-border payments infrastructure services to licensed financial institutions, such as money transfer operators, wallet operators, banks, payment service providers, et cetera, and large corporates. Uh, what does this mean? This means uh, we provide a global payout network to bank accounts and wallets across 100 plus countries, along with several other services, including treasury, regulatory uh, cover, transaction processing, reporting analytics, et cetera. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, we all know that migration is integral to societal development and uh, cross-border remittances play a very crucial part in uh, not just sustenance necess necessities, but also uh, enabling savings and investments uh, for recipients uh, uh, of these transactions. Uh, informal remittances, uh, what are they and uh, why are they prevalent? Uh, well, we all know what they are. We've discussed this uh, in detail just now. They're primarily unrecorded channels and uh, mostly dealt in cash. And this I'm talking about person-to-person -person remittances. Uh, well, these are high risks and high cost transactions. Uh, primarily such transactions are low value transactions. Uh, just to understand how uh, widespread and uh, long established they are, you can see they're called uh, through various names, um, such as Hundi, Hawala, Padala, etc., across various parts of the globe. And they're deeply ingrained through primarily social practices uh, that have uh, been prevalent across decades. What informal remittances are perceived as uh, and why are they preferred is because of ease of access where uh, the remitters uh, believe uh, and perceive that they can be easily accessed uh, because of, uh, as I said, social practices uh, through relationships that they already have. And also what is perceived as being cost effective. We will discuss in the 
following slides how at an overall level this might uh, the cost effectiveness part is essentially not uh, uh, you know true informal remittances uh, a very significant uh, aspect of informal remittances is privacy and anonymity and uh, uh, these cash uh, transactions lead to privacy and anonymity which pose challenges for regulators for uh, policy makers for market participants like us etc and these prove a boon for uh, users who are using such channels uh, you know uh, for a lot of activities which uh, uh, need to be curtailed so we'll talk about those uh, also uh, in a bit but privacy and anonymity are uh, key aspects of informal remittances uh, why uh, compliance challenges is another aspect and uh, that is uh, overhead compliance overhead uh, for consumers primarily leads them to uh, uh, use informal remittances uh, now coming on the formal uh, channels uh, which are available and uh, uh, why the adoption might not be as much is because of lack of awareness about such formal channels uh, if a new uh, migrant has gone to a country if, has migrated to a new country uh, perhaps uh, is not aware or doesn't have enough uh, you know knowledge and uh, confidence and uh, uh, perhaps uh, the documentation etc which is required to uh, go into the formal channel they might start using the informal channel and it might become a practice as well uh, and this is not uh, just about uh, you know remittances or informal remittances this is uh, uh, the requirement of the regulatory requirements the compliance requirements uh, uh, are uh, uh, you know uh, they pervade through so uh, several aspects uh, when one migrates to a new country i recall a very famous anecdote of the current world bank uh, president uh, and former uh, mastercard ceo uh, where he explained that when he migrated to the us he didn't have a credit history so it was difficult for him to uh, get a phone connection or mobile connection uh, uh, that was of course um, uh, many many years ago but uh, you know it just shows that sometimes uh, compliance overheads uh, can be tedious uh, the migrant socio economic profile also as uh, uh, my fellow panelists mentioned uh, education uh, uh, levels as well as uh, the uh, economic uh, so uh, profile of the migrants uh, plays an important role in which channels they use uh, of course uh, the cost and access of formal channels is also important are they available uh, uh you know 24 by 7 real time the, are they available uh, in pro uh, proximity to where the migrants are and are they uh, cost effective compared to informal channels uh, plays a key role uh, uh, yeah next slide please okay uh, i'll just uh, uh, talk about the impact that we have uh, you know uh, perceived of uh, informal remittances through our experiences uh, Uh, in providing cross border payment services as uh, uh, was published in the uncdf study uh, these remittances form a very large part of the uh, global cross border uh, remittances in uh, you know volumes uh, 75% of an industry which at formal levels is estimated about 700 billion is a lot of uh, money moving across borders uh, without being recorded and it has a significant impact on uh, low and middle income countries who which uh, depend on remittances uh, uh, more than 25 countries as far as i recall uh, more than 25 countries uh, had uh, remittances accounting for more than 15% of their gdp uh, in 2022 so it's a very crucial aspect for uh, at a very at a macroeconomic level not just at microeconomic levels of individuals who use Uh, 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 informal remittances. Of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, anonymity and privacy they lead. Uh, these aspects lead to money laundering and terrorism financing risk, and these are uh, not just uh, financial system risks. These are societal level risks. Yeah. Uh, 
other aspects uh, which uh, are crucial uh, which have an impact are users of such uh, 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 services remain outside of formal financial fold so they don't get access to savings investments credits government supported programs etc and then uh, it does not help in the growth of the society and the economy uh, at an overall level the, coming to the cost of uh, such uh, transactions uh, while uh, they might be perceived as low cost but the risk of pilferage the risk of cash management uh, to access cash to carry cash those risks are very high and significant and they are all add up to the eventual cost of the transactions again uh, uh, the economic dependence on foreign inflows cannot be estimated accurately uh, by uh, policy makers and thus uh, the uh, regulatory uh, uh, you know the regulations uh, the policies and the market offerings by market participants who have to adhere to those regulations and uh, offer products which are in compliance with those regulations they remain inadequate if we are not able to understand the market profile uh, you know uh, uh, comprehensively uh, one aspect which uh, uh, we have uh, come across is that in informal remittances the dispute management uh, is completely informal it is based on personal relationships and it is non standardized so if one uh, you know uh, has issues in accessing funds or it leads to pilferage etc uh the recipients and the senders don't have much avenue for dispute management or dispute resolution uh again uh the non standard forex rates uh, commissions cash carrying risk all these are to the costs of the transactions uh, eventually yeah uh, can we go to the next slide please so how have digital channels helped in you know, uh formalization or are helping in formalization uh, one uh, so here uh, in uh, when we consider digital channels uh, what i mean are transactions being delivered to kyc bank accounts and mobile wallets primarily uh, a lot of regulators uh, now allow mobile wallets to accept foreign inward remittances and uh, we are seeing significant growth there of course uh, uh, since uh, those are those come under the ambit of regulations uh, those transactions get reported and are uh, accounted for what what digital channels do uh, um, they blur the distance between remitters and recipients when it comes to tra transfer time when it comes to accessing of funds and when it comes to the convenience aspect of uh, the end to end transaction of course uh, cost time and risk for accessing cash gets eliminated because the funds get delivered into a digital instrument and the, the funds can then be used for further uh, usage for further payments for investment savings etc the forex and fee charges are transparent uh, there are uh, standard dispute resolution mechanisms uh, as per regulations uh, for consumer protection as well as industry standards and uh, these digital services particularly mobile wallet transactions services to wallets are designed for low value transactions so on an average these transactions would be lesser than 200 dollars most of the other formal channels especially uh, the ones uh, which are related to bank to bank transfers etc are designed for high value transactions the average cost as uh, we'll see in uh, a bit more detail in the subsequent slides is usually lesser than 5% for transactions to wallets uh, particularly uh, regulators can track these remittances with better accuracy granularity uh, uh, therapy works with the uncdf uh, uh, on a project uh, which uh, you know uh, analyzes granular level remittance data and helps us in uh, uh, you know uh, uh understanding the market better uh, uh the behavior of the participants uh, in a much better manner and it also empowers users to use funds for availing formal financial services as i said covid uh 
accelerated this adoption significantly because adoption of a new way of handling money uh, it doesn't change very rapidly unless the convenience aspects uh, and uh, the pervasiveness is uh, uh, extremely uh, you know comprehensive or there is regulatory uh, you know uh, obligation so uh, covid acted uh, in favor of uh, accelerating the adoption of digital channels uh, and we all talk about some numbers uh, uh, of what we have noticed but uh, uh, this is a clear indication that yes people uh, when faced with uh, you know lesser number of options and digital being a favorable one have migrated and have uh, then gone on to uh, use uh, that uh, channel more and more uh, we can go to the next slide so what have been some of our observations uh, in particularly in about the last uh, three years or so uh, from therapist perspective and uh, uh, i believe from a lot of pers uh, uh, a lot of market participants with resonate with this cash is our biggest competitor uh, for cross border person to person uh, payments for uh, individual remittances cash is our biggest competitor and that is where we try to you know uh, have an impact the uh, reducing dependence on cash transactions is what we try to uh, enable by offering services which are easy to access that is someone can access them on their devices uh, 24 by 7 uh, they are cost effective uh, they are uh, uh, and th those are cost effective uh, to end consumers because they are cost effective to participants through network if network effects that is what remitters need uh, senders uh, what do recipients need recipients need a secure channel to access funds to receive funds and to be able to receive them at any point in time anywhere without the need to go to a physical location to collect funds etc we've observed that trust is essential in uh, repeat business and in uh, growing uh, our presence and uh, in getting uh, consumers to adopt to uh, such services and this can be established in uh, uh, in the payments industry uh, uh, which is uh, significantly commoditized this can be established through quality of service which is uh, through ensuring that as much possible transactions are delivered in as less time as possible i have put uh, a screenshot of actual numbers from uh, terapay's analytics uh, showing how uh, within less than 1 minute we have been delivering to several corridors transactions uh, within 1 minute through to wallets um, almost 98% transactions and to bank accounts wherever in countries where real time payments are facilitated through uh, payment schemes uh, almost 92% transactions we've seen that funds which are, uh, which have got delivered through digital channels and therapy is a purely digital channel we do not do any direct cash payout service have grown 6x uh, and uh, out of that we've also noticed that there has been 2.5x growth in number of unique mobile wallets that we've been able to reach uh, now this of course uh, you know uh, has to be at this magnitude of uh, growth uh cannot be due to people migrating from one formal channel to another because of ease of access only uh, it can only be and the in the migrate the number of migrants and uh, the industry doesn't hasn't grown with such in such multiple so clearly there, uh, this is a clear indicator for, uh, as far as we understand uh, of digital channels being adopted by those who are in the uh, informal who were using informal channels earlier uh, we process transactions from 178 countries originating from 178 countries to 41 countries in the last 12 months and to 82 wallet operators uh, i'm focusing uh, a bit on the mobile wallet operators because 
and the other channel which is a very large channel for us uh, uh, in terms of value of transactions much larger than wallets of course is uh, transactions to bank accounts uh, and we focus on wherever we can deliver on real time transactions to bank accounts of course are uh, a very well established channel and uh, uh, with those who are able to access those channels though uh, through di uh, digitization now the bank account uh, uh, transactions to bank accounts as well as through banking services are available in most of the countries uh, uh, in real time as well and 24 by 7 so uh, that uh, has also accelerated the adoption of digital remittances uh, that was on our observations uh, can we please go to the next slide yeah. uh, some observations on how the market has overall moved not just as a participant of what we've observed at terapy so uh, as i was mentioning earlier uh, mobile money uh, and digital transactions cost way lesser uh, than uh, uh, cash or uh, 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 other channels cash or uh, you know uh, the large value transaction channels so for if we look at average cost of sending uh, $200 uh, the uh, transactions to digit uh, to mobile money uh, account for about 4.5% uh, as per the last quarter of last year uh, q uh, q4 of 2022 which is much lesser than any other channel what we also observed was that despite global inflation transactions to mobile wallets remained resilient uh, and we uh, did a study on that as well uh, the average transaction size of mobile wallets uh, remained almost the same which indicates that these transactions are usually for necessities uh, because there are uh, threshold limits as well there are thresholds uh, up to which transactions can be processed whereas what we saw on uh, transactions to bank accounts we saw a significant dip uh, in the average value of such transactions yeah uh, by about uh, between somewhere bit, uh, between 25 to 30 percent uh, when uh, 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 the economies uh, were uh, global uh, inflation was hurting economies all across the world of course, uh, service to wallets is also designed for low value transactions. Uh, so by design, uh, they are, uh, they offer options to receivers, to be beneficiaries of being able to access these services uh, for transactions which are meant for an, an necessities. We've also seen on our partnerships as well as across uh, the industry, that most of the traditional players over the counter MTOs, banks, payment network schemes, uh, such as Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, are also uh, promoting digital remittances uh, very aggressively now. Uh, it has led to transparent pricing and products which offer digital, completely digital onboarding, which offer use of AI in regulatory, uh, in reg tech and fraud detection, et cetera. So now we are able to offer much better compliance uh, services uh, and uh, fraud analysis, which helps in our reporting to regulators uh, as well. FinTechs, of course, have been focused on interoperable solutions for cross-border payments. So network effects help in reducing CAPEX for market participants. And that is where uh, uh, interoperable solutions play a very important part. In fact, we, uh, when we did a study of how much we are contributing compared to the nomad numbers, we found that TerraPay was contributing more than 10% of national inward remittances to seven African countries. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, that, that does not, uh, you know, uh, include uh, other uh, uh, countries where we are contributing uh, lesser than 10%, but a significantly large value because those economies are larger so at a market level we clearly see a shift towards digital uh, solutions and digital services uh, for cross-border payments uh, uh, we can go to the next slide please so uh, how do we go about uh, bringing the informal to the formal fold 
Uh, what can we do? Yeah. I'm really sorry, but we're running out of time. Okay, um, we'll, I'll just wind up in two minutes. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Thank you so much. So measures to reduce informal remittances. Uh, well, uh, there are two important aspects I would like to talk about. One is policy level incentivization for consumers as well as market participants and offering domestic interoperability between financial instruments because that will lead to behavioral adoption of digital payment instruments. We've seen that significantly through the success of UPI in India. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other options have already been explained in detail by the other panelists, so thank you so much. Uh, I would like to just end by saying one thing that digital is not only more cost effective, but it is also easier to scale and faster to scale. Thank you. Thank you, Saranj, and uh, thank you for those key messages of uh, the importance of policy level intervention, the importance of domestic interoperability, as well as um, the importance of digitization of uh, informal remittances flows. Um, with that, I think we will move directly to our question and for sessions. So we have um, several questions, I believe um, some of which have been answered directly um, by the panelists, but I will try and um, go through some of them. Basically, we have uh, from the central bank, uh, we have from IGAD, from Ibrahim Castro from uh, IGAD, what incentive to uh, address to um, Haptamu from Ethiopia? What incentives are planned to attract senders to formal channels? So what I will do is I will go through um, all the questions and direct them to the panelists. And I would request the panelists to respond accordingly. Um, so that was to Haptamu from, um, uh, from IGAD. Uh, to um, Harry, there's uh, one from Alcis da Cruz, Central Bank of uh, Sao Tome and Principessa, uh, who would like to know how the Bank of Indonesia estimates the value of remittances uh, through surveys. We also have um, one from Nikos Pasas, who says, well, on the one hand, informal remittances can facilitate uh, the growth of SMEs, relief credit constraints, lower cost of transactions, so on and so forth, alleviate poverty, nutrition and health. Um, but what efforts have been made to measure and include such benefits against the risks of informal remittances? So basically, you know, uh, analyzing the benefits of uh, informal remittances against the risks involved in uh, formalizing them. It's a question for UNCDF and the central banks, but I'll leave it for the central banks to respond uh, to that. Um, then we have uh, another one from, from Imad Abu Alker. Uh, could you please tell us the percentage of remittances transactions via mobile wallets across all formal remittances in comparison to the other channels? So I would request uh, Saranj to answer that. And um, there is one for uh, Marina as well, uh, linked to um, you know, how does she think that migrant perceptions to the use of financial services um, can be changed. So I think we'll just have time for these uh, questions. So I would request uh, perhaps again in order of the panel for Marina to start and then we move to um, uh, uh, Haptamu and Harry and then we uh, end with Saranj. Please go ahead. So Dipali, just to recall how we can change the perception of migrants, so how we can influence the behavior of people with whom we're working migrants themselves. Very tricky question. You know, uh, I am actually has done some study uh, in Central Asia trying to really measure our information activities and trying to, to really see how we can influence uh, the behavior of migrants. We, we speak about financial literacy a lot, the importance of information uh, activities. I think what is always very important is that the very, again, you've heard it many, many years, 20 years, colleagues, just, but I have to explain, it's in the end, it's a decision of people, it's personal earnings, so we need to be very careful in terms of when we design any interventions. So that's why rather than trying to influence, but again, ensuring that migrants really have access to, to knowledge about existing uh, if existing cheaper um, channels of sending remittances, knowledge about where they can learn different skills in terms of uh, 
managing their um, their resources and again doing it in a way so that it's it's happening in a natural manner so there there are some uh, initiatives especially uh, financial literacy uh, initiatives uh, i know that our partners with whom we work together are developing courses uh, in bangladesh we're developing some in the past we tried to develop a uh, a broad course partnership with online platforms, of course, making sure that uh, information sharing is happening in a simple manner. So again, uh, yes, that's one angle, but I think we still need to do much more on enhancing the actual information within markets and, and the action from the financial institutions and governments themselves. Over, Dipali. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Harry, can I hand over to you? And then have them move after. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, regarding the question about how we uh, estimate the value of remittance through the survey, uh, as uh, in our um, slide of 15, uh, I already, uh, we already uh, used the, uh, posted the formula about workers' remittance is a stock migrant workers times salary times percentage of remittance. The stock of migrant workers are data are op obtained from our administrative data from the our, uh, Indonesian Migrant Workers Agency. While the percentage of remittance and salary obtained through a remittance survey, um, the, the percentage of remittance uh, are specifically asked through four questions in the survey. How much is the income earned by the migrant workers uh, for a year? How many times they send money to Indonesia? How much is the average amount they send for each remittance? From number two and two, we uh, uh, from uh, number two we multiply, multiply with number three to get the cash remittance amount, and also we have a fourth question of how much is the value of goods they send to Indonesia to estimate the in-kind transfer. Uh, from number three and four, uh, the, these questions we find the total of remittance, then we divide the result with number one to estimate the percentage of uh, remittance. Uh, uh, <clears throat> if this is a this is a quick answer. If, if uh, please do contact uh, us if we need more uh, sharing uh, about our uh, surveys. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, Haptamu, can I hand over to you? Haptamu, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Dipali. Just uh, with regard to me, I just have one question which said that uh, what are the incentive mechanism to just uh, divert remittance from informal channel to formal channel to Ethiopia. And uh, as I said in my presentation, one of the buying constraints for uh, remittance to Ethiopia is uh, our exchange rate policy. Despite other factors, the premium between the official rate and the parallel rate is up more than 70%. Because of that, the remitter senders prefer the informal channel. Uh, the return sending to the informal channel is very huge. So what, uh, what the central bank is just uh, doing is that we have to move toward this market clearing exchange rate, and we have to just narrow or eliminate the premium between the offshore and the parallel market. So this is the major action plan to be undertaken by the National Bank of Ethiopia. And if we are successful to move toward this market clearing exchange rate, we believe that a lot of binding constraints will be just eliminated and the premium between the official and the parallel market will be narrowed or eliminated so that remittance senders will not be attracted to send through the informal channel. Rather, they prefer to use the formal channels. As they send through the formal channel, they, will ha they have a lot of incentives including the is just depositing in the banking system and just they can get uh, interest rates in terms of uh, foreign exchange denominated and there are also other incentives provided by the ethiopian central bank so the binding constraint for us to incentivize the remittance senders through the informal channel is to move toward this market exchange clearing exchange rate or floating exchange rate and that is our plan to conduct this very huge action by the Central Bank of Ethiopia. And still we are in the negotiation with the IMF, so we, we will be successful in moving towards the market clearing exchange rate and we can divert remittance from the informal to the formal channel. Thank you, Depan. Thank you very much, uh, Haptamu. 
Um, Saranj, can I um, hand over to you to quickly just answer that question on the percentage of remittances transaction via mobile wallet as well? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, at an overall industry level, uh, it is so it has it is somewhere around uh, we estimate around ten to fifteen percent, um, and it is growing. It was less than five percent a few years ago. Uh, for us as a participant, uh, wallet transactions by count uh, are uh, you know upwards of sixty uh, percent uh, overall. But yes, in terms of value, they are much less up. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Saran. So we have several questions, uh, which unfortunately we will not be able to answer, including those from um, the Central Bank of uh, Egypt um, and, and many others. But what we will do is we will direct these questions to the panelists after this webinar, because we have a short on time. In fact, we've overgone the time. And um, what I will do is hand over to uh, my colleague, Louis, to uh, close this webinar with a warm thank you to our panelists and also for the audience for staying so long. Louis, over to you. Thank you, Dipali. Thank you to all the panelists. I think it was an amazing session. Still more than 100 participants right now, even though we are running out of time. As you just mentioned, we'll share the recording, the presentation, and also all the answers that were not answered during this webinar to all participants. And that's about it. Thank you all for this great session and see you soon in July. We'll have another session uh, organized by uh, our team. So thank you all once again and have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.